Welcome to this uh, Tim and Jerry show. No Jerry to be seen because it's fucking early in the day. I get uh, he's still in bed because it's 5 a.m. British Standard Time, 6 a.m. German Time, and I think it's 2 p.m. your time. It is. Dog and on the dock. The one lovely person you see on my right, that's Anthony, the creator, inventor, and sole purpose behind the life of Bot War and all things tiny fight you stompy robots. Man, has this been a uh, <laughs> a heavy birth, as we say in German, to get this interview started. <laughs> yeah. Glad that we finally yeah. made it. <laughs> uh, I, oh, I totally messed up today great. already. I took a coffee to the knee. I literally dropped my first coffee on my knee, so that's grand. <laughs> I'm awake mm -hmm. for other reasons than coffee being inside of me. <laughs> well... Tell people who you are who may be so uh, ignorant of not to know what bot war is. Oh, well, uh, as you say, I'm, I'm Anthony. Uh, I, bot war is a miniature game, skirmish miniature game, but it's in 10 millimeter scale. Although that's a bit confusing because the humans in the game are 10 millimeters, but the actual robots are larger. So they'll be like, you know, 30 millimeters up to. 140 millimeters. Tall. Yeah, and I think scale wise, the rule book even mentions eight mil. So take the scale with a grain oh, of yeah. salt. It's a fantasy world. <laughs> it's just <laughs> with most under other fantasy worlds, it's all make believe. It's roughly about the same uh, size as, I would say, Battletech. Roughly. Yes. To have a, yeah. a guesstimation on, to, so people know how much, big the robots are. And it doesn't help that your robots aren't all the same size, like the Battletech, more or less. You have yeah. tiny, stompy robots and you have chunky, chunky, chunky ones. <laughs> Sorry about the dogs barking next door. They just will not shut up. Oh, the, they um, didn't, don't come through. At least I didn't hear oh, them. Oh, good. So. Good. Um, yeah, I think Battletech's six millimeter, isn't it? I, I'm, I was I'm not sure. Might, might but be. Bot wall floats between eight, eight and ten millimeters. Yeah, so. it's it's just to have people absolutely not never having had hands laid on one of your miniatures to have a rough estimation on where we're going. Yeah, yeah. So when did I start bot wall? I don't know. Like it was a few years ago now, but really, it's only sort of come on in the last. 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So, so yeah, I've, I've actually forgotten your question now, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, Bot War isn't the first iteration. It's now called, and let me get this correct, Bot War 2 Tuber Edition. Correct. Correct. So, the, so the two is yeah. self explanatory, but why Tuber Edition? Well, because it was, well, it was sort of a bit of a joke, but also like to try and explain how it works. So, so I, we I created Bot War One like really quickly. It didn't have like at the time we didn't have any artwork or anything like that with it. And then um, I created Bot War Second Edition, which was a legitimate Bot War Two. And then with Second Edition, like I, I wasn't. 100% happy with it and so I wanted to add a few things and tidy up a few things that I wasn't happy with second edition for so but it wasn't enough to do a bot war three so, so in, in uh, computer software terms it's more like a 2.5 ish yeah well I took the naming convention from Street Fighter in the 90s mm. And so, I'm, yeah, I remember. I went, now I see where I we're going. With, uh, <laughs> it's, it's essentially the same game, right? With a few tweaks and a few extra characters. So yeah. that's sort of how the Turbo Editions side of it comes. There has been jokes about a um, a Super Bot War Two Turbo Championship Edition. <laughs> Bot but... War Two Turbo Edition Supercharged Nitro. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't think that'll that I don't think that'll be. be a I thing, guess you'll you'll make yourself some enemies for every shop that's <laughs> stocking Bot War at that point. Then when they start to yeah. type in those things as category name, they they just yeah. go mental. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but, there was 
as, as I understand, Bot War wasn't uh, didn't come to you as Bot War as we know it today, but you had some inspiration like people our age have from certain things in the past. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, no, well, yes and no. So, like, originally when I first started Traders Galaxy, which is my company, I I started Traders Galaxy and it had two branches. So the first branch was to make, and the, I started Traders Galaxy off the back of like a uni uh, business course, uh, Masters in Business. So I, I used Traders Galaxy as sort of like my subject matter for most of my assignments uh, to get through my course because it felt it felt strange just picking a fictitious like thing. So I just I just started. The yes, company theory and, is, and tried is to... nice and, and shiny, but practice really makes you uh, yeah. see how things work and can go wrong in multiple ways. Yeah. So, so Traders Galaxy had sort of two branches. Like the first branch was pretty common, was to make miniatures to fit into other people's games as proxies. Mm -hmm. And that, that's pretty much what it was. But the other was to make a, a game and pitch it to a company, a, a game of someone else's IP and then pitch it to a company and get a license for it and things like that. So, so that game is very different to bot war so it's bit but it's just like that didn't go through and so like we just i, I just pivoted and it's just like well i'm there is a gap in the market for this type of genre so i'm gonna try and create my whole own universe and whole game etc so the game changed quite significantly even though like the original inspirations were there but i like it's it's quite interesting like i i still get people like contacting me oh you know like it 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 sort of i guess i understand in a way if i can remember back but i don't understand like in some cases now how people can still equate it to but it's like they want that sort of stuff so badly, but they, but it's not. I don't know. I don't know I what think, I'm trying to say. Um, I'm, you're going out of your way mentioning that IP, so I won't. But I think part of the reason is that the company in question is keeping that IP alive for the last 35 years and is still yeah. churning out products in uh, various forms and price brackets. There are one-off toys they've made that are way beyond anything I'd be willing to pay for any sort of gaming piece. Yeah, but, but I, think, I think that's I think that's the thing is that in the West, like if you remember, uh, well, I'm only going out of my way not to mention it because I'm sort of like a bit uh, don't want to give it any extra oxygen, if you know what I mean. Like because I'm like my whole drive for the last three and a half to four years is to try and create a bubble with my own oxygen yeah so so it's not like any anything sinister or anything like that i just i just don't want to but i mean everyone knows you know what we're talking about but it's it's more sort of like um like that stuff is like a monopoly in the west yeah for that company and, 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 so, and they didn't even invent it. It's just a collection right. of stuff they imported be, from though. Japan. <laughs> it never used to be a monopoly, even back in the early days, right no, when we were kids. From the, it wasn't my a top of the head, I can, can think of four more uh, TV series that had a similar vibe. But that's the, right. the one we're not mentioning all, right? is the one that's still around. Yeah, so they bought them all to become a monopoly of that. And so now, whenever someone says like giant robots or whatever, that's the first thing they think of, is 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 that. So it is. It, there's certainly, from my perspective, been a lot of challenges to try and create something with giant robots that's different to that. Yeah. Like we've, you mentioned BattleTech before, like that's that's quite different. But that's once again something that 
that had almost a similar problem back in the early days with uh, yeah. Robotech and Macross, right? You know, yes. Harmony Gold, for some odd reason, was under the impression they would have all the rights, not just for a cartoon. And uh, Fazal has acquired the rights to the miniatures. And so they made Battletech and Harmony Gold made Robotech. And both are based on uh, uh, Macross, is it? I, I think. So there's already three different IPs working on the same concept arts, which can get totally... Yeah, well, I think Battletech's, I think Battletech's like quite had to change and be quite, become quite different. Yeah. Um, because it's not like the, the mechs are, uh, you know, quite sort of different to that sort of thing now. So, but it's, it's, it's a similar, it's a similar thing. Yeah. And I think even in even in the the way I see it as well, like with um, Games Workshop and stuff like that, like Games Workshop obviously has their own IP now, but it was never like that, right? Like Games Workshop in the early days took huge swathes of of inspiration from uh, June and 2000 AD. Um, well, they didn't you know, only Aliens, take inspiration; Terminator. they produced 2000 AD. So they literally just took molds, filed some pieces off, and resold them. <laughs> yeah, correct. Yeah. So, but now, obviously, years gone. It's been rewritten, and the, it's been expanded, and their own universe has grown into um, what it is today. And like, I, I mirror very much what I'm trying to do in a massively speeded, sped up section. I'm trying to do exactly the same thing: is take some of that, some of that inspiration and rewrite it and rewrite it and weave it into my own um my own universe which is distinctly different yeah so, I, think, I think games workshops and the like they a had much more time much less um yeah. what's it called um damn i'm missing a word uh nah well those brands in those days weren't as widely distributed as they and they didn't now. have the internet. You, you only had your little printed out leaflets you, you put into someone's hand. There was no, uh, oh, not comparison, companion. What's the word I'm looking for? The opposite of yourself having to battle against. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. Help me out here. <laughs> they have brand recognition. No, like... but when, when a company is in the same field as you, but taking away your market share... <laughs> Competition. Oh, okay. Competition. Bloody yeah, hell, that, that word. Yeah. <laughs> so the competition was way less back then and uh, not as yeah. fierce. And today, these companies that have been growing did so also by the media of going all out on advertisements and dra dragging people by their heels into the hobby. So yeah. you need to speed up. <laughs> oh, well, actually, it's, uh, I'm pretty pleased with the, the speed that. You know, it's been going really like I um I'm I am hoping like the next the stuff that's coming next year, um I'm pretty pleased that will that'll be drawing inspiration from Bot War itself rather mm -hmm. than anything external. So it's you know that in that regard it's sort of going full circle. You know, so I'm pre I'm pretty pleased with how that's how that's going to work, but I. It's just one of those things. It just takes a lot of work to try and to try and do it. And the universe itself is like is quite good and and sort of starting to become sort of sustainable as well. So so it had a lot has been done in a very short space of time. Yeah, uh, you're saying the universe. The the backstories you have for Bot War is a rather. Uh, flashed out one in comparison to other games that are fairly new to the market and don't require or have the works of multiple authors behind them. So this is all you're doing. So I'm guessing uh, kudos for that. <laughs> well, I have I have um, a friend of mine that writes some great stories, a good short writer, uh, short story writer, Stephen. He, he sort of like takes what my narrative style and really puts it into like a detailed setting and and stuff like that so he's he's um his stories have really sort of added a bit more depth and level to the characters and stuff like that which has been really good but yeah most of the other um 
like the, each of the characters, etc., are fleshed out by me. I, I'm going slowly going through and writing character bios for every character. I think there's over 300 characters now. So probably about a quarter of those I'd have bios for now. Well, you so, all, always need bios for the, the big chompy ones, the small ones that killed, get killed instantly don't need a backstory. Don't, don't name your characters <laughs> I, that are can photo. <laughs> I think every, all characters have a backstory that I've written as they've been designed. But it's just not fleshed out to a larger, you know, to multiple paragraphs, which I which I've been doing with a lot of the others. But but yeah, like it's I'm I'm pretty pleased with how all the stories are connected together and the different factions are interconnected um, uh, through. It would definitely benefit from more writers and 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 stuff like that. But uh, I was saying to a friend the other day that I I don't see. Traders Galaxy is really a miniatures company as such. It's more of a universe, like it's trying to create universes, and the miniatures are sort of just the the physical manifestation of that. Yeah, and so, a way to express the game inside your universe. Yeah, so I, I'm putting a lot. I put a lot more effort into writing the universe and doing the background law, etc., than really. The, the miniatures side of things. Well, if so, those miniatures aren't your top game, <laughs> if I <laughs> spin it that round, then I would like to see how they would be if you go in, all in just on the miniatures because the, these miniatures are, and I'm not trying to flatter you here, really enjoy the details on that way more than I would have expected when the set finally arrived at my doorstep. It was <laughs> yeah. th These are so crisp and clean that and so much detail in these tiny bots it's amazing Co and again to to have a comparison for people at home if you have ever had the chance of picking up a recent battle tech set those look shabby in comparison they have may have a little bit more detail but they look way softer the bot, bot war miniatures are very crisp and i think this very blocky crisp and sharp edge design is what actually drives most people to to the uh, to the artistic style of what is bot war and what everybody else is thinking the second they see painted up versions yeah the the miniatures themselves like they're not like i have a thing i'm an old ho i'm an old school hobbyist mate like we're talking like the old sort of old hammer style <laughs> hobbies but um like a lot of the miniatures are designed, I don't want to over-detail them because I, I I find that in my own skills, like I can paint a uh, moderately detailed miniature well, but if it's overly detailed, I just like burn out really, really fast. And I can't, I find it, it's not painted as well. So I'd rather have, a moderately detailed miniature that I could paint really well and be pleased with than a highly, highly, highly detailed miniature that I could not have the skill to um, get the most out of, you know, and then be disappointed with it. Yeah. I know it's, 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 it probably sounds weird to people, but... No, um, I don't think it sounds that weird because it's basically par for the course. If you get a miniature at 28 mil scales, the usual tabletop standard size, uh, anything that's below the size of a big button just gets lost in, in anything. So you, you usually don't bother to paint it because if you're looking at them at the table, at the arm's length, those details get lost anyhow. So why even bother for a playing piece? For a display piece, that's a total different beast. But uh, Bot War having bots in there being the size of a grot... <laughs> <laughs> Those are uh, there isn't much detail to paint on, but in the same time as you said, old hammer the the old miniatures, the way the way they were sculpted, you just put on some paint and the paint just flows where it needs to be. It just stops at the edges of this the the, the section where you want it to be usually if it's well sculpted, and same yeah. for, for bot war is uh, you just take take some uh, of the wheels for example. Just paint them black, add a dot of silver for the hubcap, and bish bosh bosh, you're done. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I, yeah. 
it, it like I just don't, I just have spent like probably the last year probably about 70% of my time is on just the universe and and creating and and sort of making sure that the universe is driving the design of the miniatures driving the sort of the branding and design of the all the aspect like the artwork and and things like that so i really i really want the bot war universe to be front and center so, so that oh. you don't paint yourself into one corner just by uh, having a certain design element going from one end to the other and then going, oh, uh, I didn't want to go here. But now I'm. Uh, let, let's make a totally random example. Uh, big titty anime style robot all of a sudden. And, oh, no, this wasn't what it should be. <laughs> yeah. I still got some work to do, of course. Like s some designs are still obviously inspired by um, like external sources and things like that. So there's there's still a few, but like I think I think probably in the next year we'll see some really unique and 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 thought out designs coming through. Like I've, you've probably seen a few on the Facebook group already with things like the Atlantic and Scuttler and um, the Atlantic and Exotides. They're they're been designed from bot war itself uh, you're mentioning facebook what i found interesting is your only means of communication with the base is that facebook group is that correct or did i miss something there's no instagram no uh twitter no, I don't have instagram oh yeah yeah you're right yeah you're on silly. you're on it you follow it yeah you're <laughs> silly, silly. It's it's still way way too early to have a reasonable conversation <laughs> with myself. I'm really pulling hard here. <laughs> so Facebook group and Instagram, but no Twitter or dedicated forum or anything else. You just go on Facebook. Definitely and... not Twitter. I would never go there. Um, but I'll um, I have like discussed the possibility of um, is it Twitch. No, um, what's this one that starts with D? Discord. Discord, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's two in the afternoon, but I'm still a bit like that, Tim, so you don't have to worry, mate. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Discord, I definitely um, considered that. It's more to do with, like, my time. I just don't have the time to manage, like, I'm... Fl like Instagram and Facebook are sort of a bit interconnected. So I can post on like one and it automatically posts on another and, and things like that. So it's sort of like not as, as so time consuming as having multiple ones. Like I don't have, I try to keep Traders Galaxy completely bare bones business cost wise. So I'm really like stingy when it comes to like buying dashboards and things to manage multiple social media accounts and, all this sort of stuff. Like, I'm I'm old school. I'm actually not that great. It's like any computer stuff at all. So it's a miracle that I can even post on Facebook. So, <laughs> well, you yeah, I just fun have... with Discord then. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. I I went through a tutorial of Discord, and I I got through it, and I was just like, it was about setting up bots and all this was ah. Uh, uh, you, you, don't, you don't need all that. that that's all <laughs> optional. The, the fun thing is all these bots that are for Discord are usually for, uh, how to phrase it, if, if your community gets really big and things start to get uh, being very time intensive, like checking who's what and maybe even adding roles, so to say like you have a patron subscriber, you have what, someone who's buying every model 10 times and you want to give them a special for these kinds of things you need a bot but just for having a communication basis with your uh, closest fan base you just open a channel and go with it S similar to facebook group you have yourself and a few mods and that's it you don't need anything more. <laughs> yeah yeah and then then well then the question would be am i just repeating what i'm saying on another thing and then splitting the group like the group anyway yeah, yeah that, that, that's, that's that's the problem. Um, we are spoiled for choice in multiple ways in this hobby. We have 
so many ways of communicating. So we're not talking anymore <laughs> anywhere <laughs> because people are saying the same thing at at least three spaces at the same time. And same goes for, for games. We just have so many things to play and use that uh, you don't know what to buy. <laughs> yeah. I, I It's amazing, isn't it? Like when I was first started in the hobby way back in the early 90s, it was it was it was literally you had Games Workshop. I think that was Rel Partha, and um, uh, there was another one which was a sort of can't remember what it was called now. It was a Games Workshop proxy. I can't remember. Yeah, there but, were um, a, a few smaller companies doing uh, only miniatures, not games. So I think yeah. there was one called Mithril Miniatures, if I recall correctly. Oh yeah, Mithril. Yeah, I remember Mithril, yeah. Grenadier, Grenadier. I think. Yep, Grenadier. But yeah, like the but there was the access to those was really limited. Like, yeah, you, you, had, no you had your comic like, shop. Whatever, you had your comic shop who may have had some RPG rule books and a handful of selected miniatures, but there wasn't the internet to go on and say, I want all of these. And today you go into your friendly online store and you look at what's all available and the list is nearly endless <laughs> yeah it's like it's that massive massive so but it's it, it's it's sort of interesting like i find that that it's it's just grown so much like it's you know and yet everybody still has a ton of miniatures that they haven't painted or even oh opened. no like <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. My miniatures are all <laughs> painted. <laughs> I Promise. actually made, like, years and years ago, now this is going back probably 10, 10 years. Um, I had I had that. Like, I had, I, I mean, it was a pretty prolific painter. I'd, I had two, see this cabinet behind me here? That would have been full of, like, armies and painted painted armies and stuff like that back in the day but then i would have had double that still in gray plastic or metal just like you know somewhere in the cupboards in the closets yeah. just don't and, open that door <laughs> yeah that's right and i found it was stressing me out and i just i decided to make a decree i think it was a news resolution like right i'm getting rid of everything that i'm definitely not gonna have and i was brutal about it and I ended up selling everything, including most of the painted armies, except for the one or two painted armies that I actually used. And from then on, there, I made a thing. I couldn't get a new army until I got rid of, got rid of one and used the funds to buy another. And I and I'm cured of that now. So I, I rarely have like like a bunch of a bunch of stuff. But with Traders Galaxy, it's probably a bit different. I've always got some miniatures that i should be painting but now I'm, I'm yeah i was just paint. going to say you may not have your pile of opportunity like any other has but I, as you have just show me around in your shop there's at least three walls of blisters <laughs> hanging so you have your pile <laughs> yeah, that's true. and, and uh, even worse you're making whatever. your own bigger you're not even yeah, buying you just you're just producing a different name <laughs> call it a different name tim and then you don't technically have it <laughs> Yes, it's poo pile of opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you know. But it speaking is. of producing, um, one thing that uh, I didn't catch at first when I saw Bot was, was um, miniatures were produced in metal and resin, but also as a three D file. Did I get that correctly? Uh, no. Yes. No, but so, yes. <laughs> so no, I have, I have some STL files available for discontinued miniatures on the website. Ah, okay. So rather than just let those those files sort of disappear forever, people can buy STLs and print them out and and do what they want, but they they'll I'll never have current miniatures so, as STL. So it's, it's more for archival purposes because you can't keep yeah, hold of the molds like, indefinitely. Well, I'm not well, see, I don't need them anymore for to for the business, right? Because they're discontinued. So I'm happy to then share them. Like, I, I, technically, obviously, you sell them, but let's face it, 
Like, there's no way to stop any of that being shared. And yeah, pirated. as long as you, you don't know, invest into massive DRM, once they're out there, they're out there. That's right. So, so you know, so I don't mind, like, selling those STL files. I, I don't want them shared, but, like, I can't do anything about it. So, um, to me, it's those things are sort of ways for people to donate to my cause and and they get, like, an STL file or whatever and, Technically, it's a don donation to to Traders Galaxy, but um, but I won't share. I would actually be out of business if I just did STL files. It's just it's not possible. I know actually um, some of the big groups that sell STL files on Patreon. Um, they it might seem like they're making like a lot of money, but they're actually there's actually several people operating those things and that money is shared between like a lot of people sculpting to get the numbers out required to make the to yeah. make the thing it's, it's just not viable and, and um, technically they aren't even selling um, the the files they are just having a pledge level and you just get them because patreon won't allow for selling so yeah. uh, i guess it's just a steady stream of revenue as a baseline And then, and they're just getting by, and then, yeah. and I was surprised. Like I was, I was surprised, like um, because it sounds like a lot of money, and and you just think, but when you split it between all the people required to make that amount of miniatures, I think it was like twenty or thirty a month. Like it's, it's pretty, it's pretty full on. Yeah, and it's not just. Uh... The, the selling the, the miniature or the art you have, uh, it's all, all, all also the uh, well, what you call it, the, the side costs you have. You need to have your health insurance, your everything that comes with being self employed. Uh, yeah, that and people actually, usually don't, don't think about. Yeah, they don't have any of that at all, unfortunately. And so, like, it's they don't really have, like, from the ones that I know anyway, they're not, they're just people they're not like a company or anything like that they don't have company fees they don't do tax returns you know there's no which is fine for them like that's that's completely fine but i'm just saying that they that there is it's <laughs> i was so ignorant going into the <laughs> traders galaxy team and I, that's coming from no someone idea. who came from uh, business school <laughs> Yeah, like, oh, oh, business school doesn't prepare you. Nope, it like, doesn't. It's like, it's like they might give you some, like, good theory and stuff like that. But uh, I'm st I still shake my head, Tim. It's like some of the things, it's like, what? Like, how, how do people even survive? <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe I'm doing something wrong. But it's nope, just like. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm self-employed <laughs> myself. This is just the way it is. Yeah. Speaking of the way it is, we need to take a technical swish. Because I'm getting a call. I'm back in a minute. Hold on to okay. your hats. Okay. And we're back. <laughs> Technical difficulties, as is tradition in this channel. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where did we left off? We, we were talking about being self-employed and how much cost there is oh, to yeah. it that you don't get taught in business school. Well, technically, you yeah. get taught, but you tend to ignore that until the first bill arrives from, let's say, your health insurance. <laughs> I, you I want me that, to pay um, what? <laughs> one one thing that I was completely ignorant about is how, to me, business is just like solving problem after problem. That's that's what it feels like. It's just like the problems just increase in severity. Like you never. You never get to a place where you're like, oh, I've solved all the problems now. Now we can just like coast away and, and everything's no, it never fine. never stops. <laughs> no, it's always another problem. There's another thing. There's another challenge. And yeah. in that regard, it's a bit of a grind. And even if uh, those are things you can't really influence, like, say, Brexit or something, Uh, if, even if your local authorities suddenly go, oh, let's change your VAT from this to that and maybe put you in a different tax bracket and all of a sudden you're all, oh, fuck, <laughs> everything goes down the drain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much pretty much how it was. I remember in the early days um, when I was first learning to spin cast, 
because I didn't even know how to do that. Like I was learning to spin cast and like I made some like mistakes, like a lot of them actually. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to cost me $200 or something like that. And I'm thinking like at the time, those things nearly crushed me. Like I remember like um, tipping hot metal on my foot. Mm, <laughs> like, lovely. And I was just like, oh, just enough. Like, you know, it was just another um, thing. But now like the complex complexity of the problems are so much greater you know yeah. it's, it, it's like they might not cost like a huge amount of dollars but they cost a lot of time and and it's yes it's 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 been an eye-opener that's for sure yeah it's uh, not to uh, to make anybody step back from thinking doing something similar to you getting self-employed in the business just take the leap just don't go all in just at the beginning maybe just do it as a side business at first and try to learn the tropes of the trade <laughs> and then if yeah well if, if it, it doesn't that, crush you you can go on yeah well that's actually good advice that's sort of how it happened like one of the courses i think i said this in another interview one of the courses that i did um that i nearly failed was the only one that i actually came close to failing was about that is that like it was essentially saying just start with what you have just yeah start. Don't, don't go buy expensive equipment don't don't put yeah. in money up front you need to make money before you start investing money yeah that's right just just start with what you have and just start and just and you just do one little thing and just just uh, i think the i think the the catchphrase was just do the next thing yeah. just do the next thing don't think about three steps ahead don't think about where it's going to be in a year Don't think about all, which just seemed to be the opposite to anything you think you learn about business plans and all this sort of stuff. I can tell you right now, the business plans that I made for my uni course are went out the window yeah. in the first like those, month. Those plans usually don't survive the first year of business. But when yeah. I went uh, going self-employed, uh, I got funding from the state, and for that to have, we needed to bring in uh, a business plan. That's totally out the window after three months. That's just yeah, that's right. No, that's not happening. <laughs> yeah, and so, but yeah, just do the next thing. Just do a little bit, and just keep investing the money that you do make, and just keep investing and keep investing and keep investing. So that's that's really how Traders Galaxy survives. Like we've, I've had no big investor or anything. It's just like just keep turning it over. Keep, yeah, and keep turning it straight back in. And as you see, said, you started with, with spin casting. I think starting today is easier than ever. You just need a piece of software, a rather capable PC, and then you can start making your 3D models. And you don't even need to invest into a printer. You just go somewhere where there is a printer and do some test prints before you buy one. And after you've sold some of your STL files, you can reinvest into a printer on your own and then go nuts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, the spin casting thing was just a way of producing them. And that's the only way, the cheapest way I knew how yeah. to do it. So, but, but yeah, like it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting how far it's come. Uh, you saw around the garage here before, but like if you'd have seen it three years ago, it would be very different. <laughs> it's like a, a little front corner of like, I, I think I saw some pictures car. somewhere online. <laughs> yeah little front corner of junk and you think really that's like traders galaxy but yeah that's what it was yeah there like are some that. some businesses that that actually work that way where you go holy fuck and you're making money this way <laughs> yeah and some of them it's really make feeling. good money <laughs> it's amazing feeling uh, when i first started spin casting actually i literally felt that i was that i was like printing my own money it, you, you were like, actually producing stuff people wanted to buy That's right. Like it's it's such a strange feeling, um, but yeah, I I I I don't know if you know. I'm not. I don't work full time on Traders Galaxy still. Oh, I, 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 I guessed as much because simply by the sheer number on the uh, Facebook group where I was, even if every member of the, that group is buying every release, that's almost barely enough to have to sustain one person, let alone a family or a business. But yeah. um, I think since since uh, I 
saw Botwo for the first time, and this is about a year ago, roughly. Um, I think since, since that incept first inception by my, myself knowing about your work, your numbers have gone up in a central way that's rather fine. <laughs> could be better, but could be a lot worse. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 str like I've, social media is a complete enigma to me. I don't understand how it works. Like I watch the like you as an admin, you get obviously all your little analytics and and stuff like that i'm um, i'm like well, why did this go down this month and then this is up this month i uh because it's not natural it's not growing organically it's manufactured algorithms that from the back end of the likes of meta and every other company if you I find i find it interesting when there, there's been some times where the group has really had a lot of engagement like something's happened or it's huge man there's this massive spike and almost three days exactly later after that spike there's a massive dip of exactly the same amount <laughs> like it's like what <laughs> so yeah, it, that's... It, it almost like evens it out it's like every, almost three days immediately after a massive spike there's a massive dip yeah that, that, that's that happened because... every time yeah, that, that's because Facebook is curating the content people see on their starting page. You always get your most voted or however they put it stuff from. You always need to change manual to see the latest things you wanted. And they don't keep that setting for some annoying reason. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I'm so sort you, of you open up Facebook and the first thing you see is somebody posting stuff from 27 hours ago and you go, yeah, why would I be interested in that? I want to see what they are doing now. Mm. Well, that's it. But enough of the past. How's the uh, immediate future for, for Bot War? There Sorry, is Tim, a new I'm game planned, as you said, a uh, miniature skirmisher. Well, yes. I'm, I'm actually... Um... I don't have any plans for Bot War 3 at the moment. And that's good to hear. I, I still haven't finished reading all of my material. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a I think that Bot War 3 would be quite some time away. I'm um I'm enjoying I'm I'm sort of I reckon 70% through like fleshing out uh the current Bot War game. I want to put um each of the um the factions I want to have their own sort of like mini army book. Mm -hmm. So people can really learn about the faction that is filled with sort of art and background and character bios and all the stat cards and stuff like that. So I want to do one for each of the factions. I've got Rise of the Democracy coming out soon, which is the um, sort of 30 millimeter version scaled version it's a bit it's a lot more crunchier game so a lot more detailed rules it's played on a larger probably i'd say maybe more traditional fantasy war game size mm -hmm. so um the actual rules are finished i'm just waiting on artwork and miniatures to be finished painting to design like finish the design and the rule book and, and things like that i haven't decided how i will release that I, I mean initially it'll be a free digital release but i haven't decided on how the actual physical box will release the miniatures are mostly already out now they've been out for a little while so so yeah so i've got that I, you know pretty much just trying to expand and and polish bot war while releasing Rise of Democracy. I've also got uh, Broken Skies, but that's pretty much already done. That's like a game that's already been released. And that's then the aerial fighting game, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So it uses um it actually uses the the sort of planes and jets from Bot War. So um but it does come in its own box game, but it's um you can use the same models across and the it's, same it's, dice. Like the same up. scale. Yeah, well, the the planes and stuff in Bot were a slightly smaller scale. Like, I know this sounds we're getting into scale again, and I can see your <laughs> mind's just going to like that. It's like, um, but yeah, the planes are just a slightly smaller scale because obviously, if you had a full scale, same scale planes as you have, then when they change into the bots, 
Like there's a massive scale difference. Yeah, like, but that never never bothered anybody watching the cartoons back in the day, did it? I mean, <laughs> just 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 look at uh, one leader of one faction standing next to a little yellow guy, and then they both transform, and there's a massive different difference in size. <laughs> And yeah. today, this this makes me always think of a Pratchett's Discworld when they are afraid of being turned into something and people say, yeah, I could turn you into a frog, but what do I do with all that stuff that's not fitting in the frog? There would be a whole <laughs> big bubble of gooby stuff to the side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Broken Skies is actually... We, we need to do more videos of Broken Skies, actually, because it's a really good game. It, it's more... It's a bit more probably board gaming like um it's hard to explain what it's like i did see um, did, how, would you compare it to x-wing probably in the sort yeah, of way well i've not played x-wing so i don't know oh. <laughs> so, so uh, if i remember correctly uh, broken skies is played on the hex map yeah that's right it, it actually reminded me someone was playing i saw the beginner's game of battletech with one-on-one -on, -one on a hex board yeah that, it, that's the, the beginner's box. It, so. Yeah, it looked a little bit like, like it's sort of moot. Like Broken Skies has specific maneuvers on the hex that you can make, like mm -hmm. barrel rolls and stuff like that. And there's specific ways you have to move on the hex. Whereas that didn't look like that because I've not played BattleTech either. So yeah, I don't, the I don't. The, uh, the hex maps on BattleTech are actually the, the classic mode. So you're just going from one square to another. You have a certain amount of squares where you go and you need to turn your miniatures. That's costing you a turn. And then there's the Alpha Strike version, which is playing like an ordinary board game without any grid on the table. So you need to have some measuring device. Um, so I'm guessing it's size-wise, you only have very little miniatures on the table for Broken Skies. So it's somewhere in between X-Wing and, and Battletech. Uh, saying from my perspective as having played Battletech and X-Wing and not have looked at the rules from Broken Skies but that's the, the first impression you have if you look at the artwork you've got your hex map you've got your little tiny fighty flying things on the table and yeah as you said you have certain maneuvers dialed in so you need to know where your ships are going not to crash into anything yeah yeah so the, yeah the moves that you can make are a little bit sort of a bit like um a bit like chess in the sense that certain, like you can choose certain, um, or maybe not like chess. It's hard to explain. Like you, you can, like if you're doing a barrel roll, you can move a certain amount of hexes to the side, but you can't sort of do anything. And that's going to use up so many of your movement points. Yeah. And then it's predictable it, for your opponent if you see a certain type of, of a fighter to know, yeah, this can do this and this. So potentially he could be in this general area. So I need to plan for that. Yeah, but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of movement possibilities available to each fighter. So um, the idea of the game is you've got to try and get around behind the enemy fighters because it's much easier to shoot them down um, if you're on their tail. So mm -hmm. if you try to shoot a jet fighter like side on, then it's it's really hard to hit because it just flies straight past, you know. So the whole idea of the manoeuvring part is to manoeuvre around and create scenarios where you can sucker people into trying to shoot your stuff, but really what you've done is expose their tail to you and your other guys can come around behind and, and sort of light them up. Yeah, classical uh, so, dogfighting. Yeah. So that's that's sort of how Broken Skies works, but we, we, we definitely have to get more videos up of that. My YouTube videos have been terrible. I need to get... <laughs> to get more uh, let like, me tell you doing nice youtube to... is a whole nother different beast it's a hobby in itself and i really <laughs> yeah. for experience <laughs> i just do this yeah. for fun and it gets annoying i i wouldn't want to do this as a profession in any way shape or form it how i'm currently doing it so if you want to make money from just doing videos whatever platform you're using you need professional help <laughs> to a degree yeah yeah definitely like just all the editing and stuff we don't even edit any of the videos in um for the traders galaxy channel like it's just, it's raw as <laughs> it's like it's like oh, yeah. it's, to me that's a bit of its charm 
It's so like filming it's with your cool. smartphone only gets you so far. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, but I, it's 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 in that to do pile, which is a very big pile, by the way. It's just in in the yeah, to do pile. That, that, that's a thing people don't rec- realize when they start going self employed. This I have, would like to do things is getting more and more every day with every passing minute in you. Oh, this would be nice. And this would be nice. And all of a sudden you're standing in front of a mountain going, holy fuck, how do other people do this? Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, answer, that's they have money. They days. employ people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, um, you know, we do what we do with what we've got, right? So Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the... the big pros on board wall as other may, many other small companies you just see the product and you feel there's much more uh, love going into those things as like say things from games workshop which technically on a um, craftsman uh, level do look very good sometimes not always but at the same time you feel yeah this is just to sell there, there is no passion behind it there's no not not no one sculptor going this is my op- magnum opus this will be my thing to be remembered by and, and then you see other companies uh like oakbone studios by joff who do, does lovely little metal miniatures and you just go yeah he's all in on what he's doing <laughs> yeah the same same yeah. for bot where you just look at these and go Somebody had fun making these. This is not just somebody slapping on geometric forms to reassemble some kind of robot thingamajig. This is somebody had put some time and thought into it. Yeah, yeah. We spent like it, it is. It is one of those things that you. We just. My whole thing is I just want to make the best product that I can, like with what with what I've got available, and say so, like it's pretty. It's I'm pretty pleased with it. Like. Some miniatures I think probably could have, could have done better, but like for the most part, they're they're pretty cool. If you're saying, um, if if you look back on on everything you have done so far, if you had infinite amount of money and time, so you really would be free to do anything. What would be your next thing? Let's say for board war. Is there any project you had on your plate saying? I would love to do this, but this is in no way means vi- viable in any sorts of way. Oh, that's a good question. That's I mean, a good for, for myself, I, I'd love to see, uh, I hate to see, let, let's put it, a, a toy version of any of those that actually could change. That would be somehow very awesome in the gaming scale. I know this is technically possible, impossible almost, but uh, that would be something very interesting. Oh, in like a fifty millimeter model? No, no, like the 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 current size you have on the gaming table, and just make them go morph into oh, yeah. their alternative forms as a, as a model, yeah. as a painted model. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be pretty. I don't even know if that would be possible. I guess it would be possible, but you would need a pair of tweezers. Yeah, and to... and you need to to source some kind of resin that's barely unbreakable. <laughs> <laughs> which may, would sure make it, molding sure and possible. yeah somebody probably is already tooling things and showing the world oh look here's my 10 mil hot wall that it's going from one mode to the other and yeah <laughs> there's been a lot there's been a lot of um stuff that's sort of like it would be nice but not necessary so like i've thought about a bot war animated show mm-hmm I've thought about uh, actual toys. Um, I've thought about um, uh, like proper, you know, the proper books and the proper, you know, you know, novels and that sort of stuff about that side of that side of things. I've thought about like other games as well, like launch. I don't want Traders Galaxy to just be a one game company. Mm-hmm. So, you know, other games like Heroes of Centaurus and stuff like that, which are completely not in the bot war universe. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's just it's just one of those things you just got to prioritise. And, you know, most of the, most my goal at the moment is to get the 10 core factions of bot war all released with the box set. 
and sort of like a, um, a faction guide, which is your army book type of thing in digital. And we're nearly there. We're not, we're not far away from that. I've got overlords coming out first of September as a pre-order and they'll be delivered before Christmas, I hope. And then uh, Red Star Nations will be the last one to get their box set. And so that'll be the 10 factions. So that'll be good. So will, will there be any sort of um, tournament scene coming up? Oh, I hope so. I really hope so. Like I, I'm an old tournament player back from back in the day. <laughs> I would love, I love because I feel that tournaments. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, hardcore games. But the good thing about tournaments is you really see how the meta flows. Yeah, and you can, as a designer, you can like use that data and like okay, okay well this is like trending at the moment you know and all that sort of stuff so it's a really useful tool i'd love to have tournaments oh, oh, and so also exploit what, what, the stuff what i found when i got into star wars legion way back when they when the game was released the tournaments were really the only way to see how other people thought of using tactics and thinking outside of the box and even and especially when the when games grow and you get more and more units that interact in different ways and, and seeing how things shift and all of a sudden your all powerful one-off guy is no use to you anymore because they have a effective counter and you can't think of these things all by yourself even not as somebody who's making these things Thank you. bless you <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that's exactly that's exactly right. And like, I think the for me that's particularly important with Bot War because I, it's not like it's not a heavy tome of rules. No, so it's not. the the idea behind the game is that people are making decisions and creating those synergies in their lists that are definitely there and using those tactics. But I do feel that there is sort of it is quite linear at the moment. They're, like people haven't discovered a lot of, of the more complex um, character synergies and, and things like that that you can do to, to make games. And to be honest, uh, even Aiden and I, Aiden's the guy I play against most on the videos, we haven't really, we, like we just don't have the time to like delve into it in that, in that level or the, um, you know, the, I guess the, the will that you would have as a tournament player wanting to win a tournament, you know? And yeah, it doesn't and, help if you're playing the same uh, guy over and over again because you know his play style, you know his army almost as well as your own. So you get stuck in some kind of uh, repetitive motion all, almost. So if you had a tournament or a local gaming group that has variant players using different armies in different ways, you, you are forced to think outside the box and maybe do some more thinking on your own than if you're just casually playing the same guy over and over again. So yeah, I'm guessing and, and at I this point as well is that tournament players might choose an army and look at that army in 50 different ways over a period of a year, you know, and and that the armies that are going to tournaments are in the in the top tables and stuff are usually highly polished. Like there's not an ounce of fat on on those armies that's been polished over it. and that's how you sort of get the most out of those those armies at, at tournaments whereas when Aiden and i play we just like what are you playing oh i'm playing dark stones oh well, i'm playing and we literally picked it up right then and there and start we haven't played like two years with the same army and discovered every single you know nook and cranny that that army has in order to get the most out of it and i think that's that's sort of what tournaments do but yeah i would love to have tournaments we yeah, just need and with an active it. active tournament scene you usually have someone uh, seeing something that nobody else have thought of and just goes hmm if i use these in conjunction i could deep strike and deny my opponent his complete setup zone and just go haha turn one i win you're fucked <laughs> yeah yeah and that's great and i could then write a write that out of the rules if that if that happens you know so but yeah like it would be great to have that let's not to say i would take anything away from narrative or theme play like i prefer i actually prefer that type 
of play, but I do think there's a value in all types of play. Yeah. Um, I, I myself, I usually play fluffy as hell. So uh, w when I play Legion, I just go with classical lists like having a Vader, having an operative, maybe some scums, and then just hordes of stormtroopers and go, let's fight them. <laughs> we'll throw buddies at, a, at the enemy until they drown in blood, no matter who <laughs> blood it is. <laughs> just go nuts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I, one day, one day I hope that that will definitely happen. I, I, I have got a thing out that I support, like I would support tournaments and stuff with prize support and things like that, but it's just one of those things that it needs to sort of happen and happen in, a, you know, with some decent sort of numbers, but it, it'll get there if players yeah. continue to grow. and, and so it's, you, you need it's some a, kind of critical mass to even be able to make a tournament. Uh, looking yeah. at the numbers from the poll I did on Facebook way back a few months ago, I'd say doing a uh, tournament in Germany is currently hard pass. <laughs> it's not very viable. I guess there would be four or five people <laughs> even willing to travel, even though I, I know there's more interest on the models and most people are just uh, repelled by the sheer fact that you can't get them here on a, in a proper way. So uh, next, next sub is a Danish or Swedish shop and they don't have their shop in English, so you need a translator, and it goes out the window at the oh. same time. Um, is, are you talking about Alpha Spell? Yeah, yeah. I they know do they do. Them. They they do ship to Germany. That's not the problem. But the shop is completely in one language. So if you don't speak the language, uh, getting information on I how thought it was, they had an English thing. I thought well, they, they, had they only have an English FAQ somewhere hidden. But even uh, finding okay. that is. <laughs> sort of <laughs> and uh, I, I, many many of my local gaming friends are they're not very used to play in English let's phrase it that way yeah. they more or less are able to get by with rudimentary school English but usually they have uh, things translated by uh, Games Workshop and the like so every every group book that I would like to do that that's one of the things I could add to that list if I had infinite time and money it's like get someone to the translate. Rule. Yeah. Even if it's a digital version, right? Like even if it's a digital version to have someone translate into a different thing, it's like the rule book's free. Uh, so yeah. it's just a matter of like changing the words. So <laughs> in my in in my ignorance of like knowing languages, I assume that that's what it is. So but um but yeah, like I think that's one of the strengths of the Bot War rule book and sort of like a bit of a, I know it sounds silly, it's like a bit of a weakness as well, is that people look at the rule books, oh, not much to it. But yeah. it's actually really easy to learn. And it's because the game's played a lot in the decision-making process. So you don't need a lot of rules to tell you how to make decisions. Yeah, and, and, and uh, to be fair, if you look at, um, and I'm going just back on games I have the most experience in, going back on X-Wing and Legion, those rule books aren't very chunky either. It's the, the basic rules are very basic. Those are four or five pages. And for mm -hmm. Legion, it's just getting bigger and bigger because of keywords, making special effects happen, to, to mm -hmm. put it loosely. But the actual rule, how a unit moves and shoots, that's so basic and ingrained into the actual mechanic it's yeah <laughs> maybe put yeah, out, yeah. Uh, that to the uh, to the community and go anybody volunteering to to uh, translate rule books <laughs> yeah well it's it it's um i haven't really asked stuff like that um i what in the very early days i asked stuff like that and um I, it didn't always go well, so I'm sort of like I'm sort of like caught off asking stuff like that until I'm sort of ready to yeah. um, to put the time and and stuff into it. Like, um, yeah, it's just it's just sort of one of those sort of one of those things. I th I think I need to just cut the paragraphs and send them to someone, have them translate, and then just put the paragraph straight back in. So I don't have to redesign the whole book and and things yeah. like that. I, I've seen Project do that. That doesn't go well. Oh, really? Doesn't? Yeah. Oh, that's the, the thing is, languages. Um, if you go from one language to the to the next, there can be uh, 
translations that go from a five sentence, a five word sentence in one language to something that is six or seven words in another language, but also these words almost double in size than the previous ones. So it really gets a bit weird. Um, I'm not saying it's uh, an, a not viable way, but if you have a pure text form, you can use some things like DeepL, that's a online uh, translation thing. You use that for a mock-up and then let somebody else proofread it who, who is fluent in that language, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe a native speaker. Yeah, yeah. And usually I think that's that's more or less the way to go. But we're, we're getting way ahead of ourselves, I think. In, no, in it just due comes time. Down to, a lot of that just comes down to no, – it'd be lovely to have and just comes yeah. down to time. I would just I wish I had the time for that sort of stuff. It's one of those things um, – you just, I don't know, it just seems so time poor at the moment. So, and, and also it needs to be financially viable for a business. Let's, let's face it. It's uh, uh, with all intents and purposes you have for being the optimal product. There's just a line you need to draw. Otherwise you would go down the drain and just burn money in the process. Well, in regards to the rule books, like I've got the rule book already. It's just a matter of translating it into another language. Yeah. So you, I guess it would depend on how much that sort of stuff costs. So it would just be the same rule book. And it would only be digital. So yeah. it wouldn't be um, – I wouldn't be printing out a, a multiple language rule book, you know. Maybe so some, some of my viewers will uh, pick up the mantle and get back to you and <laughs> say, hi, I would volunteer. <laughs> I throw myself <laughs> into the pit of fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe. Maybe it's, that's, you know, that's potentially possible. But, yeah, it's, I've, you know, everyone else has their own thing going on, don't they? And, and so it's, it's, it's just one of those, it's just one of those things when you, when you get time to do that stuff, you know. But it, it would be, it, it would be good to get to reach more, Europeans. Yeah. That, that, that's the hand and egg problem again. If you don't have a rule book in language one, the language one market is very barren to you and other sides. If, if you have that, you need a market to make it viable. So this is, I think, one of the prime examples where you could use crowdfunding for actually doing stuff to have people go, uh, we go this far, we can go different languages and then simply pay someone to do the work. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's probably... Like I've thought about crowdfunding a few times since my disaster of a crowdfund that I did back in whenever, 2020. And so, well, it wasn't that, it was a disaster, but it wasn't a disaster yeah. in the sense that it all turned out well in the end. But, um, it's, but yeah. It, it, it's a possibility. But I need to look at the time because it's getting uh, yep. quote unquote late <laughs> and I need to start do, doing my work that pays for bills. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you need to go and have some lunch. I need to go pick the kids up from school. Oh, see. So there's the bestest uh, point of uh, jumping up the train, I guess. Anthony, I thank you for making time in your day. Um, I thank everybody who's viewing this video. Uh, there will be links in the description to the Facebook group, to Traitor's Galaxy and whatnot. And if anybody has any inquiries, just uh, send them my way. I will push them forward to Anthony or just join the Facebook group for God's sake. It can't be that hard, can it? <laughs> so with that said, Anthony, have Thanks, a nice everybody. day. And uh, we will see each other sometime. Maybe if you do a Kickstarter we, or, or not a Kickstarter, just a crowdfund. We don't want to brand anything here now, do we? <laughs> there's, there's enough going around. So <laughs> Thanks, with that Tim. said, bye. Hey, Mike. Take it easy. Hey, wenn dir das Video gefallen hat, würde ich mich über einen Kommentar freuen, vielleicht auch über ein Like und wenn du ein ganz knorker Typ bist, dann äh, auch ein Abo oder so. Muss aber nicht. Aber ein Kommentar wäre nett. Vielleicht guckst du dir auch die anderen Videos an, die äh, irgendwo sein müssen. Im Kanal gucken.